Hello there, I'm Brian Taylor. Down the years you may have seen me on the telly or heard me on the wireless, but this is different. This is the Brian Taylor podcast brought to you by The Herald. I'm sorry if the voters have let Henry and Donald down by actually having a mind of their own. But, you know, the reality is that voters want change to take place. At the very least, they want a referendum to take place. I don't believe there'll be an Indy Ref 2 vote within the next five years. A brutal union um, does not supply 80 vaccine centres. A brutal union does not inject £26.5 billion into, into Scotland. But I do believe that there are ways that the union can change to accommodate an assertive, an ambitious, a modern Scotland moving forward. Well, there, I'm Brian Taylor. Very warm welcome to the latest edition, this special edition of my Herald podcast. Start with my customary plug. If you want to get all the magnificent Herald output on all the various platforms, you can uh, subscribe, of course, and you can get money off, 20% off, by mentioning Herald Pod 2021. There's the, the details at the bottom there as well. Now, today I said a special item. We're going to look at independence. We're going to look at the union. We're going to tiptoe across the quivering fault line of Scottish politics, the issue that underlines pretty much everything else. But perhaps from a slightly different perspective, of course, the big question is yes or no to independence. The big question is yes or no to the union. But could there be a, could there be a third way? Could the union itself be significantly reformed without trimming Scotland's power. One man who thinks so is Henry McLeish, the former First Minister and indeed former devolution minister in the UK government. I'll hear from him in a moment and then discuss it all with Mike Russell, the SNP president and director of the SNP's independence unit, and Donald Cameron, MSP, who leads for the Scottish Conservatives on the Constitution. They'll join me very shortly indeed. First of all, Henry McLeish. Henry, welcome. Thanks very much indeed for, for joining me. You're working up a new book on ideas about the union. In a draft version, you describe the union as being at a crossroads with absolutely no guarantee of survival. Well, I think, Brian, thanks. First of all, thanks very much for having me on the, the, the podcast. I mean, um, I've had time to reflect, you know, lockdown gives you that uh, opportunity. And I've also recalled the fact that it's nearly 25 years now since 1997, when a Labour government elected oh, yeah. a white paper published and then two successful referenda questions answered by Scotland. Um, and then I be began to look around and think, well, there's maybe a number of ideas that maybe shape the future. I mean, first of all, of course, we're involved still in the pandemic. Um, we've had Brexit. Um, um, and of course, we've had the election of Boris Johnson. And we're now looking towards climate change. And I was reflecting on the fact, Brian, that there's a, a limit to the amount of political energy around um, to invest in all of those. And it seems to me that this is a time to pause and maybe think of a better debate. The second issue for me, of course, is that I've always recognised that despite the polling, despite the referendum, despite all the elections, Scotland is bitterly divided on the, on the, on the central yeah. question. And as a consequence of that, there is no settled will. So part of the book is to look at what might constitute a settled will. And I suppose the other point, Brian, is this. I think the debate has reached a level now where we're talking about unionism versus nationalism. We're talking about conservatives yes. versus uh, SNP. We're talking about Scotland versus England. And I think the debate could be going in a much, much better way. So in a sense, what I've been trying to do is to see not so much whether there's a third way, but actually to see how we can reshape the current debate um, without in any way stepping on the toes of the political parties who might want this, might want that, but actually shifting the focus to the union because as far as I'm concerned, it's not Scotland that's out of step or Northern Ireland or Wales or parts of England. It is the union's inability to see the modernity of Scotland's advance and actually think that there is another way forward where a union can change and accommodate what I regard as a multi-nation framework instead of looking at a united kingdom that won't give anything away and remains highly centralised. On that United Kingdom point, Henry, you talk in the text, you know, I stress it's, it's work in preparation, but you talk in the text about what you call brutal unionism. What do you mean by that? Is this, you see something it's in some way undermining the devolved settlement? Well, I've been keeping a watchful eye, Brian, on what's been happening. And whilst it's okay to look at the Prime Minister and some of his comments, re-smog, etc., there is a brutal reality behind all of this. And my worry is this is called muscular unionism, but it's brutal in the sense that we're not only looking at a way ahead for Scotland, and as you know, 
I support a much more ambitious Scotland. But, but the issue seems to be for me is that that unionism means that we're in danger of dismantling the 1998 settlement. We're in danger of devaluing uh, devolution. And I think we're in danger of delegitimizing the efforts that Scotland's made over the last 20 years. So I think there's a new danger in all of that. So we're not just faced with fighting for a way forward for Scotland. We're actually looking at the defense of what has actually been achieved so far. I mean, what evidence do you have for that? The Tories, I'm sure, would say that they are, and we'll hear from Donald Cameron on, on this very programme, but the, the Tories, I'm sure, would say that they are merely stressing the nature of the union. They're stressing the fact that Scotland has two parliaments, a Scottish parliament and a UK parliament. They would say that they are underpinning devolution, not undermining Yeah, well, I, I think it wouldn't be a surprise. I mean, I reject um, most of that because, in a sense, it's, I mean, I can, I can talk about the buffoonery of Rhys Mogg, for example. That's fine. But there's a deadly intent here. You know, in the 60s, Brian, Scotland was conceived as a region. Scotland was conceived, in, in some respects, contemptuously, as just part of the Union, part of the United Kingdom. That is still there. And, of course, Boris Johnson, by his very nature, is a centralist. He doesn't see, in my view, the, 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 the intellectual aspects of, of devolution, Scotland wanting to do more. And so, therefore, I think that the internal market, you know, issues that are supposed to be transferred, from Brussels to Scotland have now been interrupted yeah. there at Westminster. We've seen the idea of a tunnel. That's been scrapped because it was nonsense. And now we're in a, now we're in a situation yeah. where, where there's lots of comments being made. But the, but the key thing about my approach, Brian, is that there is nothing yeah. coming from the union which actually departs from this highly centralised union. It was a manufactured state in 1707. In 1536, the Welsh joined, 1801, the Irish, 1707, the Scots. It was manufactured then, and I cannot for the life of me see why Boris Johnson and other political leaders at Westminster can't get the idea of a four nations framework and move forward on that. That would give Scotland its place, but it also give the English regions its play, their place. When you, when, when, you use phrases, when you use phrases like a manufactured state, that's the sort of phrase that a, that a nationalist would use would would you be comfortable with independence? Well, um, I, my sympathies lie with a much more ambitious Scotland at this stage, Brian. And I've said that publicly before. I would like to think there is another way forward that we can see a transformed union, not federalism, because I don't think that's possible. But, and not kidding uh -huh. ourselves on it's an easy job. Westminster finds this manufactured state. You know, there's lots of exceptionalism, Brian. There's lots of delusion in my view. There's an absolute sovereignty of a mindset going on. And unless some of these things are changed, then I fear that we'll just stumble along, we'll stumble along, and there'll be no resolve. And the settled will that I think is important to arrive at a consensus will not, not be achieved. So in a sense, the sting in the tail of my comments is if Westminster, uh -huh. the union, its institutions, the traditional parties don't respond, then that will only strengthen the resolve of those who seek independence. And would, would you, would you I, I'm not saying you're advocating independence, but would you be content with independence as an ultimate uh, outcome if the union cannot be reformed in the way that you describe? I would be content, Brian, if the union changed. Um, um, my hopes are for that. And it seems to me there's a lot of positive ideas that Boris Johnson, um, the Labour Party leader, Keir Starmer, could adopt to take us forward. But what I'm saying is that this is not to allow the SNP to think that they won't have their say, or Labour, or the Liberals, or the Tories. But what I'm saying is, what is the best bet for Scotland? Because the last 150 years, we've seen a debate at Westminster, especially in the latter part of the 19th century. We've seen a debate, we've seen an acceleration of that over the last 14 years. But Brian, is there a debate on the future of Scotland, or is, it, or is there merely a debate on independence to which Westminster and the traditional parties say, no to another referendum. I don't think one will take place for the next five to 10 years. But they're also not coming up with a vision for the United Kingdom, which can allow Scotland to prosper, Wales, London, Northern Ireland, and of course, regions of England at their different paces, different ideas at different times can actually evolve and realize their ambitions. It doesn't seem to be too much of an ask 
But currently, Westminster is just simply not responding. OK, let's, I'll bring in the, 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 the other guests in, in a moment. One final question. You're talking about reforming the union, and I accept that the, you know, you're, you're at the early stages of, of preparing this document, early stages of the thinking. But I'm not seeing a blueprint here, Henry. I'm not seeing anything specific, particularly about the English regions. I'm not seeing that blueprint. I mean, I think it's fair to say, Brian, this is not a blueprint. What I'm looking at is the, we've, we've seen discussions about federalism. We've seen discussions about more devolution, more powers. But I want us to be really quite far reaching and look at the idea that in you know, 2021, we can see a picture of the union which acknowledges four nations, acknowledges London, acknowledges the regions, and says quite simply, there is a better way. Now, the mechanics of discussing that I can leave aside just now. But it is the idea that Wales is ambitious. Northern Ireland has its problems. Scotland has its ambitions. England, London, the regions. And it seems to me that, that all of that is live. All of that can create opportunities and challenges. But the main point is, can Westminster, with this absolute sovereignty idea, depart from the past and embrace a new future. So that's the basis upon which we can build, Brian, the blueprint you've talked about. But it's just to get a bigger, deeper debate in Scotland, and not one that constantly says no to Indiref, to no to this, no to that. Yeah. That's negative. What we need from the traditional parties is a positive vision of where Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom can go. Okay, Henry, thanks for that. Bigger, bigger, deeper debate, you say. Let's have that right now. Let's be joined. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Donald Cameron and Mike Russell. They're both able to to, to join us in, on the podcast here. Thanks both very, very much indeed. Donald Cameron, let me come to you first. You'll have heard what Henry McLeish is, is saying there. Is, there. is there a brutal unionism underway? Is, is your party guilty of the accusation is undermining the devolved settlement? Um, the short answer is, is no, as, as you might expect. I mean, I just, um, if I could start with just well, thanking you for having me. Um, fascinated by Henry's comments uh, just now. Uh, and, you know, to, to the extent I agree with him, we do need a, a more nuanced debate about this and, uh, and, and a positive debate. And I think we, you know, we all are aware of the, the constitutional trenches in which we, we so often find ourselves. And, and I'm, I'm certainly in favour of, of having a, a positive debate. I think where I depart from uh, Henry is is that I just don't agree that the union is is broken or is in some way in need of radical reform, and I don't agree uh -huh. that we we witness brutal unionism um, uh, for, for two reasons. Firstly, I think you know in the last ten years the Scottish Parliament has become one of the most powerful devolved parliaments in the world. Um, we've seen landmark devolution in 2016, devolution of welfare powers, tax powers, etc. Uh, and following Brexit, we've seen um, further powers being repatriated and, uh, and devolved to the Scottish Parliament. The second point is, is, is to pick up on the, on the pandemic. I mean, a brutal union um, does not supply you know, 80 vaccine centres. You know. A brutal union does not um, inject £26.5 billion pounds into, into Scotland. Uh, you know, and I just think in a week in which we've seen you know, the, the UK military personnel uh, come and assist uh, the Scottish Ambulance Service, for example. I, I don't mm -hmm. think that is, you know, emblematic of a union that is sort of uncaring, that is centralising, uh, and, and all the things that, that Henry said. But Donald, what about what about the you mentioned powers d devolved from or transferred from 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 Europe? In practice, those have been retained in in London to to a large extent, and also when it comes to uh, additional expenditure upon the NHS, there's been an attempt to to, to badge that and put that directly. To the NHS without it going through the, the 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 Barnet process and going to Holyrood is that not bypassing devolution? Is that not undermining the the settlement to some extent? Well, on that on that last point, I think I think the UK government have made it clear that that it would it, you know the usual rules would apply to to the health um, and social care funds. Um, but no, I don't think I don't think you know that there is a question of bypassing uh, the, the usual processes. I mean, what I what I would say is that undoubtedly um, after the independence referendum and after Brexit. There is now a, a very different landscape in Scotland. Uh, we have to work through the uh, concepts and practices of common frameworks, uh, the UK Internal Market Act that Henry mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. the Scottish government's policy of keeping pace with EU law, trade agreements, um, the, the very difficult question of intergovernmental relations and, and in, interparliamentary relations. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and all, all these are, uh, you know, th- there are undoubtedly tensions. I, I don't deny that. But, you know, I, I still think that union, um, uh, despite all those, those tensions having to play out, um, the union is strong. I don't think it is brutal. And I think if, if, if anything, it is in a you know, better state now than it was. If I could just finish one point, Brian. Yes, please. I, I don't believe that devolution is static. You know, it's not, it's not set in aspect um, as in, you know, it, it happened in 1997. It, it, it will change. It's a process. Um, but but, but, I, but I, I fundamentally disagree with the idea that in some way um, the union is, is broken. OK. Mike Russell, w- what's your take on this? Is the union capable of salvation? Do you accept uh, Henry's arguments that, that you know, it, it's, it's at a crossroads? Or, you, know, you would argue, of course, for, for independence. Well, I mean, I'm going to mention something that nobody's mentioned so far is the voter. What has the voter chosen to do <laughs> up until now? The voters are choosing and have chosen. Uh, you know, a government which is committed to independence. They have chosen parties in the majority which are committed to a referendum. I'm sorry if the voters have let Henry and Donald down by actually having a mind of their own. But, you know, the reality is that voters want change to take place. At the very least, they want a referendum to take place. I mean, I, if I may move from 21st century voters to a 14th century cleric, you know, William of Ockham observed, you know, in Ockham's Razor, in his philosophical concept that he, you know, essentially the, the smallest and, and least number of steps, the better. You know, reductio ad absurdum. And in actual fact, Henry is simply talking about reinventing more steps, more vagueness. You know, I, I mean, I'm sorry to say I, I didn't get anything like you, Brian, of a, a blueprint of any description. So what I want to do is three things. First is I want to listen to the voters. The voters have said that there should be a referendum. Ergo, there should be a referendum. Secondly, I don't think there's a lack of thinking elsewhere. Indeed, my good friend Mark Drakeford uh, gave a, a very important lecture last year on this. Uh, he and I gave lectures the year before on it at the Institute of Government. And Mark was arguing for something I think is very simple, which is that sovereignty should be retained in each of the nations and they should be free to do with it what they wish, to pool it or to move on elsewhere. Now, that would seem to me entirely fine. And Scotland, therefore, if it chose to have a referendum, could have a referendum and could move on if it wished to do so. But the third point I just make is, is this. I mean, I, I like Donald. Donald and I have contested in, in two elections. But to argue that there has been no undermining of the union, in some sense, I think he even said the union was better than it was. I, I think, frankly, he must have in that office of his a big bucket of sand in which he has had his head for a very long period of time politically. Because you know, the, 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 if you look at the Internal Market Act, if you look at what's taken place since Brexit, there has been a series of outrages against the Scottish Parliament, against the legislation that we have, and it has got considerably worse under Boris Johnson. So I think it's quite clear where we should go. We should have that referendum. And if the people of Scotland demand that referendum, have that referendum and choose to be independent, they should be independent. But, you know, let's listen to the voters. I mean, I'm, I, you know, neither Henry nor myself are, are, are in, still in electoral politics, but Donald is. And people who don't respect the voters tend uh, pretty soon not to be in electoral politics. Donald, then Donald, then Henry. Donald first to answer that particular point. Then Henry, you've been very patient. Donald Cameron. Yeah, but I, I just, I just don't agree with that. I don't think voters want a referendum. I mean, we are in the that's why they of voted. one of the biggest economic and health crises that this country has ever known. And you know, recent polls show that only one poll I think showed that only seventeen percent want a referendum in the next twelve months. And I, you know, that people's priorities are recovering from the pandemic. Yes. You say, you say, but that's what the voters say. Hold on, hold on. Yesterday, yesterday, Scotland recorded its highest ever death toll from COVID in the last seven months. We are still in the middle of a terrible crisis, and and we need to concentrate on people's jobs, on their health, getting the health back together. And, 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 and the idea that another referendum should be high on the list of people's priorities is... No, important. nobody's saying, nobody's saying it. They're, they're, saying, they're, saying, they're saying late, forgive me, Mike, they're saying late 2023 at, at, at the earliest, once the, the, the pandemic has been, has been uh, brought back un, under control. Nobody's saying that, that it should happen in 2021 or 2022. Are you saying you rule it out for the entirety of this, this Holyrood Parliament? Uh, absolutely, I don't want to see a referendum. I don't think the, the public, the voters, don't want to see a referendum because they're because the because go on, go on, go on. Mike, 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 go on. Go on I Mike. mean, you know, people don't want a referendum according to Donald, but actually, they voted for parties that offered a referendum. 
So either you think democracy is utterly irrelevant, and I don't think Donald thinks that. I'm not accusing him of that in any sense. Or it is sophistry to say that people do not wish a referendum. They have voted for it. The parties in government have said that they will deliver it, and they will deliver it. And anybody who says, oh, no, no, you shouldn't deliver it, really is working against the interests of democracy. And again, I don't think Donald means to do that. I'll, br I'll, I'll, bring in, I'll bring in Henry in a second. But Mike, in what way have the, have the voters voted for it. The SNP do not have an overall majority, either a popular majority or in terms of seats well, at, at Holyrood. If a bill came into the Scottish Parliament to deliver a referendum, it uh, would, a majority. would gain a majority. That is normal parliamentary yeah. politics. I know what we've heard so far in this podcast, I have to say, is a lot of avoiding of normality, but normal politics and normal, normal parliamentary process should operate. Henry McLeish. Well, Despite, despite Mike's uh, robust um, defence, I mean, the settled will, Mike, is about electors. The set, settled will is about the mood of Scotland and where it goes. The settled will is about trying, it's not a political theory, it's not like the general will of Rousseau, but, you know, the settled will must be something which is advantageous to Scotland wherever it moves. And I'm reminded in that part of the conversation about Brexit, an insane, an insane decision in my part. And it was 52-48. And what it's done is left an unbelievable legacy of a Britain, a union, a UK permanently divided. Now, I'm no great supporter of first past the post. In fact, I think that is, in, in many respects, medieval. When I talk about the settled world, I agree with you. It is the people of Scotland that will decide. What I'm hoping for, and what I'm aiming for, is an idea that despite 170 opinion polls since 2014, despite you know, the fact that the SNP have wiped the floor with the other parties over the last um, 14 years, there is still they have. inclusive yeah. consensus, if at all possible, on a way forward. So that's why I'm saying that the voters are vitally important. But let me also say this, Brian, that when you look ahead, I'm really disturbed by the Brexit legacy. And what I would, would like to see in Scotland is a situation where the parties, the traditional parties in the SNP and Greens, remain bitterly divided. The country remains divided. And then we go in for another referendum, which, as, as Mike said, will happen, should happen, but with no hard consolidation of what kind of vision most Scots actually want. So I'm the majority. You, you argue, just, just, just a second, Mike, just a second, Mike, just a second. Mike, you, you, uh, Henry, you argue that, that Scotland should have closer links with the, the European Union, but how can that be done in practice within a, a, a UK system? Well, I, I see a whole raft of things that Scotland can do, its parliament, a more inclusive effort and in allowing the other parties to re-engage with the debate. And if you take the Nordic countries, if you take Ireland, um, if you take the, the, the arch for consensus and collaboration in Europe, if you look at the um, single market, look at the customs union, I believe passionately that we should be very close and remain close to the European Union in every practical way that we can get. Now, but the ones you mentioned, the Nordic countries in Ireland, they're all independent states. No, no, but hang, but hang on a minute, Mike, before you come in. Hang, hang on a minute. What I'm saying is you don't have to, you can build up these links that I've talked about. And this may be a bit too nuanced, Mike, but I would want to see Scotland go much, much further. I've been asked about independence. I'm sympathetic. But I think if the union could reform itself in the radical way I've said, that may be another option. All I'm talking about is that instead of there just being a narrow debate about independence, there should be a bigger debate about the future of Scotland, which should entertain other ideas as we move forward. It may not work. Mike, 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 Mike Russell. Mike Russell, then Donald Cameron. I have a of sympathy with what I think Henry wants, right? Henry wants you know, a, a, a consensus within Scotland about how we move forward, right? And, and I'd love to see that. But the reality is, if Henry thinks that we can get closer to Europe through a single market customs union, and that will be permitted by either the current UK government or given the terms in which uh, Keir Starmer was setting out his vision in the longest political suicide note in history, as far as I can see uh, uh, yesterday, then that's not going to happen. You know, there's, that's simply not going to happen. And in that, indeed, the Tory government is going to be there, it looks like it, for a long period of time, yet again. So here's the question. Here's the Occam's razor question. You know, Occam's razor defined, I wanted to look it up, as entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. That's the argument. 
right? So if you can't change Westminster and you can't change Westminster and it's not going to change, what do you do? Do we sit around for the rest of our lives politically? And Donald's the youngest one here, but it'll be his lifetime too. Do we sit around accepting that the Scottish people cannot have what they vote for, cannot have those closer links to Scotland? Or do we do what everybody else does, which is to be normal, to be a small nation independent in Europe as a full member of the EU? That's simple. And that addresses the issue of entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. The, the, the entity we don't need is Westminster. The entity we do need is as a member of the EU. Mike, thanks. Donald Cameron. So, I mean, if I, I mean, if I could answer this by posing a question to Henry, um, which is in, in terms of a blueprint. I mean, you, you've said you don't, you don't want to see a, a federalist structure, a quasi-federalist structure. Um, I'm just interested to know what, what do you, what concrete ideas do you have? I probably have to buy the book as a result. Um, but um, uh, but but what concrete ideas do you have for reform? Because you know we, we talked a lot about COVID, but you know on one view, COVID saw the four nations of the UK doing their own thing, going different ways. Sometimes uh, sometimes having similar policies, sometimes having different policies. What works for Scotland doesn't necessarily work for England, and vice versa. And you know, on, on one view that showed divergence happening, uh, and 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 the union being able. To, to cope with that, indeed, foster, nourish that. Um, and so, so, you know, I pose that question to you. I mean, is it what exactly um, would you change? Well, let, let me link, let, let me link Brian, you know, Mike's comments and, and Donald's comments. Um, what I think I'm seeking in, is a situation where we talked about federalism. Churchill talked about it in Dundee in 1909, but but Westminster is not capable of moving to that. The second point, Mike, is this. It is not a matter of trying to delay decisions. But what I'm, I'm thinking at the present time is that Scots are divided on where they want to go. Now, if you want to put to me that the first past the post system allows you one more vote than the next party or individual, then you go forward. What I'm actually trying to safeguard against is, for example, they could have an Boris Johnson may change his mind. Let's just fantasize for a minute. He changes his mind and he says to Scott, yes, you can have your referendum. And that referendum is lost, Mike, if it's held in the next one or two years. Now, you may argue that's politics, that's life, that's a decision. But what it could mean is that independence would be dead and buried for a long time. That's just the nature of the reality of it. And secondly, what I'm worried about, it could halt any possible changes in Scotland, because the union would turn around with Johnson and others saying, well, we told you so, and basically you don't have any further developments. Now, all I'm arguing for, for Donald and Mike, is to acknowledge that whilst Mike may talk about winning elections, this, that, and the other, the country is bitterly divided. On How do you resolve things democratically? No, well, Mike, I'm not talking about anti-democratic. I'm actually saying, How do you resolve things? We just sit around waiting forever for something to happen. Does the Archangel Gabriel appear? I mean, no, be, no, Mike, be careful with what be, you wish because what I'm saying is that you, 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 can have a, you can have a referendum in a year's time or two years' time. And all I'm saying is, a bitter, as, as Lincoln said, you know, house divided against itself cannot stand. We are a house divided against ourselves. Well, that, very interesting to quote Lincoln. Very interesting because also. Mike. You know, Lincoln recognised that in the end, decisions had to be made and that you had to make a choice. Now, you see, it seems to me, Henry, and you know, with the greatest respect, because I think it's not been easy for you in, in this, with this respect, you are reluctant to make a choice. Now, I, I understand that. You, you, you know, many people are. But I think that the moment of choice is actually long since past. Brexit is the exemplar of why choice is essential. Because in your argument, if we just hold back, and think, oh, well, we'll wait and see what happens and we'll try and have a different debate. All that time, the Scottish democracy is being undermined, the powers of the parliament are being undermined, and we are being shown that we are worthless within those arrangements. That is what is taking place. That is what is taking place. And therefore, the longer it goes can on, the worse it will be. Mike, can I pick you up on one point that Henry McLeish made, is, is the point about a second independence referendum. Do you accept that if, if the second referendum is held and your cause, the independence cause, is defeated 
once more, even by a, 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 a tiny majority? Do you accept that if that happens, then the case for independence is, is set back decades of no, generations? I accept generations? that Scotland will not become independent. And, you know, the circumstances we're in presently now are probably not going to repeat the circumstances we're in now are the Brexit circumstances. But I don't think things will get any better. And therefore, the motivating factors for independence will not change. See, Henry seems to think that in some sense, people who presently support independence, and we now know there are you know, 50% of those people, um, of the people in Scotland, yes. are in some sense going to be content with something else. I think we're well beyond that. I think we're well beyond that. The question is, well, you're rejecting my how, how can we have a referendum which is inclusive? I think that is a question. I think the question is not whether we should have a referendum, it is how we could have one that is positive and inclusive. Now, I thought much in 2014 was positive and inclusive, but I have seen practice, for example, in Ireland on the abortion referendum that means that we have to do more. We have to be more. But do you just just let, let me let, let me pin you again? I, just one th this point about holding a second referendum. If we hold a second referendum and and the SNP, the independence, pro independence side lose, it, is that it for a, a prolonged period, or do you come back you again and again so and again? Somebody can quote me on never end them, so ever. I accept, as I accepted in two thousand and fourteen, that if the people of Scotland vote against independence, Scotland will not become independent. But I don't accept that uh, political ideas. Here forever by fiat, you know, just because Mike Russell says it shouldn't happen. You know, the circumstances produce the political dynamic. So I can't guarantee what the circumstances yeah. would be. I can, however, predict that, you know, I don't think I'm going to live forever. And therefore, I think it would be unlikely that I would go beyond that. You know, but well, indeed, I'm sure it is a depressing thought for every all on this call. But the reality is we need that referendum. The people of Scotland have supported parties that are committed to that referendum. Democratically, there has to be that referendum. Could I, could I put to Henry a point to you, a question that came in from Robert saying, has devolution gone as far as it can, short of separation, his choice of, of word? I mean, he's, basically, he's, he's asking whether devolution has reached a point where the next jumping off point is independence. I don't think we've reached that point, and that's the that's the, that's the, the, the stressing of the issue. I mean, uh, I think devolution is a lot more. There's a lot more can be done with devolution in Scotland as it is, and that's the point I made about political energy. I believe the Parliament yeah. itself should be the platform to try and attract back the the Conservatives, the Liberals, and Labour onto the constitutional question. They've just been saying no to NDREF too. They're just being saying no. It's negative. What I would envisage, Brian, was a situation where devolution can travel a lot further, and that could be done without without independence. But look, Mike, to that point, coming back to your strong point, I said I said to Brian previously in discussions we had before this that what I'm really saying is that the sting in the tail of what I'm writing up is the fact that I have, you know, I believe my expectations are low as far as the union is concerned to kind of go in a way that I would predict. And what I'm also saying is that that is the um, high noon. That is the last chance saloon. Now, you may argue, well, how long will that go on? But as far as I'm concerned, we haven't exhausted the possibilities. Johnson may actually be the person that does exhaust them for us. But on the other hand, I can see the reasoning behind your view that the 50% that want independence, Mike, what about the 50% that don't want? But I'm willing to say that between them, between them, there is discontent and grievances that need to be rectified. I agree. I Mike Russell, Mike Russell, very briefly, then Donald Cameron. I mean, I've just said you need to draw in in a in an inclusive manner those people who presently do not support independence, and to explain to them and to provide guarantees to them that that you know what we are talking about is not only reasoned but reasonable and is a process of normality. All those things have to happen. But you know, Henry. You know, forgive me, but you know, I, I, I thought when you were talking about, you know, yet again having trusting people to deliver, you know, the book of Proverbs springs to mind, hope deferred maketh the heart grow sick. We've been having this conversation in Scotland for a very long time, and things have just been getting worse. We should be able to draw a conclusion from that. And the conclusion is we need to choose ourselves what is best for Scotland. And of course, we need to do it in an inclusive way. And, and we can do it in an inclusive way, because I do think that there are, there are some people who will never be persuaded. But there are many people who can be persuaded if we do it the right way. Donald Cameron. Thanks, Brian. I mean, I, just picking up on a couple of things that have been said. I mean, I, Mike talks about in, inclusiveness. But the problem is 
But most people's memory of the 2014 referendum does not reflect that. It was it was it caused huge divisions, um, and many wounds which have not healed. And you know, one example of that is that the you know the the motivating factor in May's election for how people voted was the constitution. It is still, as Brian said at the start, it is the fault line that runs through. Uh, Scottish politics. And, you know, I, I just don't believe that, you know, it, for all the warm words, and Mike, you know, I respect and like you, but I do not believe that that, that will happen. We all know what it's like on, on social media. It is very, very toxic. Um, the, the other point I'd make is, is it, it relates to what Henry said about federalism. I mean, I think, well, I'm not a, not a federalist, but I think one of the big problems of federalism, of a federalist solution, is that it requires all four units of the United Kingdom to um, to work together, and at, at present there is no there's no appetite for it in England, um, let alone other parts of it. And I think that's a real that, that's a real problem for for the Federalist solution. Um, the last point I'd make is is you yeah. know, trying to think of ideas of how we how we change devolution. I think there is a lot to be said for further devolution from Holyrood out to local authorities. Uh, and, and, and others. And I think that, you know, if, if there is a, an avenue to explore, I think that is, that is really interesting. And Mike represented our Garland Butte for many years. I represent the Highlands and Islands. You know, these are very rural, remote places. And I think that, that one of the more interesting developments that could happen in the future is what we do in terms of localism and empowering local communities uh, to do things uh, within Scotland and within the United Kingdom. Let, let, let me pick you up on one point briefly before I bring in the others. You, you mentioned that what you said was the divisions created by 2014 without in any way accepting that. It's up to you to make that point, up to others to counter mandate. But do you accept it? Would you make a similar argument for the 2016 Brexit referendum that that was also divisive across the UK as a whole? I think it, it was it was divisive and it was a very it was a very close, close result. But I've always been of the view and I, I voted for Remain, as, as Mike will know. But but I've always been of the view that that was a, a vote put to the United Kingdom as a whole, uh, that it, 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 the question involved the United Kingdom's membership of the European Union. Yeah. And although it went the way that I didn't want it to go, I, you know, we have to respect that vote. And I've, I've always... Yeah, said but well, you, you, you say you have to respect that vote, but do you accept that, that Brexit, Britain leaving the European Union, Britain, including Scotland, uh, being taken out of the European Union, do you accept that as a material change in circumstances which justifies a further referendum upon independence because the, the, the frankly the game has changed since 2014 no i don't i don't accept that and i think that you know we talk about the, the settled will i mean you know I, I think the decision of the of scotland in 2014 was conclusive and and you know voted voted very definitively to remain in the union conclusive, conclusive and eternal conclusive and eternal donald i mean forever I'm, I'm not someone who says there should never, ever be another independence referendum. I certainly do not think there should be an independence referendum uh, anytime soon. We have got well, what, far, is, um, what, is, what, is, what is anytime soon? Um, you know, define it. I mean, how, how would you define it? When should that be? Well, I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to get into the game of sort of time. And who frame. should I just decide think that? At the moment, people's people's uh, priorities are about recovering from COVID. And I repeat what I so said. If the start. people decide that there should be an independence referendum, as indeed they have done, so, that should not be a fact. I, I don't accept there's a mandate for all sorts of ah, reasons. There's, is there a mandate for the, was there a mandate for the uh, UK to leave the EU? I mean, in Johnson's victory in 2019? Yeah, absolutely. There was a mandate. Yeah, yeah. although that was on a lower vote and... You're comparing apples. To, you're comparing apples to. No, Henry, what you're Henry doing is denying democracy, and I, I know you're uncomfortable with it, Hang on, guys. You have a fascinating Henry situation that we're now talking about the 2014 referendum. We're talking about Brexit. Now, you could argue possibly that any referendum uh, could be uh, divisive. It's a rough political tool. But on the other hand, the point about um, 2014 is that 55-45 as against 52-48. All I'm arguing, in a sense, trying to, I suppose, assist both Mike and Donald um, and the leaders of the other parties in Scotland, is that is there not a better way of taking a huge decision that would be based on some form of settled will, which is not procrastination in saying that Scotland should never be independent. I've been accused by many of being uh, with Mike and his colleagues in that camp. But on the other hand, 
That doesn't mean to say that I cannot look for some resolve. Now, Donald made points about federalism. Donald, you're absolutely right. The reason why I rule out federalism is because it is not realizable politics. You're right to say that Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, England, and within England, Manchester, London, the Southwest, that are all at different stages of evolution, political evolution. And that's my point in saying that what we don't need is a federal structure because it's not possible. It's not on the radar screen at Westminster within the, between the two main parties. But what I'm arguing is that why shouldn't Wales or London or Manchester or Scotland, and I put Scotland in the premier position because we are further down that development, why shouldn't they be able to go much, much further in terms of powers that I've talked about. Um, I've given to Brian some stuff which talks about things we can do. But it's not yeah. saying that everybody must move at the same time for the same reason, for the same finance, for the same process. And that, I think, is a bigger change. Mike smiles. I appreciate that. But, Mike, at the end of the day, <laughs> I'm actually a, a sympathiser. But what I'd like to think is if Scotland takes a, a vote on independence, it is a vote that captures a better portion of the Scottish electorate than you currently have. And we talk about 50-50. Henry, Henry, if, Henry, if there were, you, you, you're looking for reform of the union, but if, if IndyRef 2 is held and it's yes or no to the union as presently constituted, how would you vote? Let me answer the question by saying that I don't believe there'll be an IndyRef 2 vote within the next five years. What I'm saying is, Brian, and that's a sting in my tail of the message, that if the union doesn't look like from Labour or the Conservatives, that it's going in the way that I'm talking about, then yes, I would support independence. And it's not going in the way you're talking about. It's going in the opposite direction. No, but, but, but you, you, would, you would vote for it. Yeah. Because, I, because, the, because the, the, the thesis of the book, Mike, the, the thesis is... Uh, hang, hang, on, hang on, Mike, hang on. Let, let Henry finish and I'll bring you in. Henry. Maybe you criticise me for bending over backwards to have another opportunity. But if, I, if I'm convinced that the union, um, for a variety of reasons that I've outlined, will not change, then I could support independence because I believe that each of the nations of the, of the UK has the right to self-determination and move forward. All I'm arguing, and sorry if I'm complicating matters for anyone, is that there's a chance to do something different and let's have a debate about an alternative to independence before there is a vote on independence. I am not against but about debates. I mean, I'm absolutely not against debates. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I've been at this task for many, many years, you know, and things have not got better. I don't think that's my fault, but might, maybe it was. Um, things have got worse. And I just don't see them turning around. I, see, I hear no squealing of tires in the, in the democratic system. There's going to be a massive handbrake turn. And, you know, the, the UK parliament and government is going to suddenly start thinking about Scotland as, as an equal partner. That is not going to happen. Uh, and though I, I admire your, your openness to it happening and your, 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 your confidence and your, your, your generosity, it's not going to happen, Henry. And, and therefore, I think we have to make our mind up what we are going to do. And the way to do that is to allow the people to choose. Now, that is not going to be tomorrow. And therefore, there is a, a period between now and, and whenever the vote is in which possibly the UK government could change, except that I, my experience in 2014 was all sorts of promises were made and not kept. But the, the track record on this is not good. So my view is, let us move ahead with what the people of Scotland have said they want, for which a, a referendum for which there is a majority in the Scottish Parliament. And if during that debate, which will be a debate about the future of Scotland, it looks as if something else is possible, Henry, you may decide not to vote for independence. But let's not keep putting this off forever. Actually, that instability is bad. One of the reasons I would have liked to have seen a referendum before the, the end of 2020, which was derailed by the pandemic, was I think it's best that we come to a decision now, in the light of Brexit particularly, of what we're going to do. And part of that is making sure that we have a continuity so we can move back in as quickly as possible to the EU. Donald Cameron, it's best to make a decision uh, rather than leave things in there. No, I mean, I'm not going to go over what, what I've said before. I, mean, I just don't, don't believe now is the time for uh, absolutely that we should have a referendum at, at this point in time. Um, but just picking up on something Henry said, I mean, I, you know, I think one of the really interesting, and going back to what I said about localism, one of the really interesting things that is happening in England and Wales is 
know, what, what mayors are doing, what, what of, of, of the different political stripes, what they're doing, what's happening in North Teesside, what's happening in the West Midlands, what's, you know, and I think that this, if you're looking for, um, you know, a, an avenue of, of, of where, where, where devolution can go, I think this is one of the most interesting um, elements to it. I don't disagree with that. Uh, I think that there needs to be more empowerment at a local level. Donald knows I've spoken often about that. But you know, one of the ways not to achieve it is for the European Charter on Self-Government, Local Government, which the Scottish Parliament passed to strengthen local government in Scotland, is not yet enacted because it's being challenged by the UK government. So in actual fact, the policy on, on actually localism is being undermined by the very people who are telling you they want more localism. I find that a bit bizarre. Let, let's, talk, let's talk about finance, public spending and, and taxation. Donald Cameron, could Scotland afford to be independent in your view? Could Scotland be an independent economy? I think it, it, it's, um, it would be very, very difficult. I've never, I've never said that Scotland couldn't afford it. But uh, you know, let, let's look at what the um, uh, uh, Institute for Government report that came out a week ago said. You know, it said, for instance, that Scotland would find it harder to borrow a uh, variety of reasons. A newly enabled Scotland would have no credit rating. Um, there would be years of, of deep cuts. Um, you know, hugely respected um, institution. Um, talked about the you know, um, lack of diversity in the, in the Scottish tax base that we would um, that, that we, we because of our history of an implied deficit. Um, you know, th there are all sorts of problems, the problems of currency, etc. So I, I think it would be incredibly difficult. It would involve um, very deep spending cuts uh, and or tax rises, uh, probably a combination of both. And we would be in a very dire position indeed. Mike oh, Wilson. too wee, too poor, too stupid. You know, the old arguments, they just keep, they keep being resurrected. Look, just look around you. Look at, look at the continent of Europe. Look at, the, there are 11 members, I think, of the EU, the same size or small in Scotland. They are more prosperous. They are paying better pensions. They are doing far better. What we see in Scotland is a result of dependence. Uh, what we need is the medicine of independence. And I simply reject those things. A lot of that is based upon things like JERS, which are a snapshot of how badly the UK has managed the Scottish economy. They say nothing about how the Scottish economy can operate. But, but, but Mike, the, Mike, the report done by Andrew Wilson and many others for, for the SNP on, on economic growth accepted broadly as a starting point the, the, the JERS figures, that there is a larger structural deficit in Scotland than there is for the UK as a whole. Do you, do you accept well, I that? Probably, I probably question it now after the pandemic and given where we have been. But even if that were the case, Andrew's report also indicated a, what, 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 what you know, he saw as a reasonably painless way of moving out of that over a, over a reasonable and actually quite quick period. It was not the gloom and doom that we have just heard. There's an awful lot of misrepresentation in these figures, an awful lot of over, over interpretation of these figures. I, I, I take you know, the knowledge of this from what I see elsewhere. And what I see elsewhere, for example, is a declining UK uh, going into deep trouble financially, which cannot actually have the shelves of its supermarkets properly stocked. And yet apparently we have to treat these people as the paragons of financial virtue. It does not wash. Henry McLeish, what, what do you make about the financial and the taxation and the public spending situation vis-a-vis -vis union and independence? Let me say this first of all, Brian, that you know that 2014, it seemed to me that uh, economic fears were the ties that bound the union together at that point. Indeed. Um, and it seems to me that that when if there's another referendum, as there will be, um, that they will still, still be salient issues. And what I'm concerned about is how we resolve the idea that we leave the United Kingdom, seek to join the EU, and then have maybe similar difficulties to what we've seen in Northern Ireland. But, Northern Ireland. but, but, but yeah. the point is about economic fears. If the union, if it's only economic fears that are binding us within the union, then that's a pretty poor state of affairs. And I believe, Brian, that Scotland could be independent tomorrow. But Scots have to make a judgment next time round, as well as the, the fears they had before. They've got to be courageous if they want to take it forward. But they've also got to accept that, that the Brexit insanity has made life more complex and much more difficult as we move forward um, as a nation. Donald Cameron, you seem keen to get back in. 
No, I'm just, I mean, I don't, I don't think it is wrong to point out that Scotland's deficit in 2021 was 36 billion. Well, pounds. That's, that's putting, up from 50. Hold on, Mike. Listen, listen for a second. Hang on, Mike. Hang on. 15.8 billion the year before. That represents 22.4%, almost a quarter of Scotland's GDP. Uh, and compared to the UK, that was. 14%. I mean, you know, you may not like the journal figures, Mike, because there are... I don't like them. I don't like them. I don't. The, economic, the economic case for independence, I'm afraid, is worse than it was in 2015. Let, let me put, my, my let me put two arguments to you. One is I question the figures, and I will go on questioning the figures. I know the Tories don't like them being questioned, but I'll question. But the second one is, even if that were true, it's your fault. It's you and the Tories' fault. You've been running the UK economy, and, and before then, Labour, but that seems a long time ago. It's your fault. We shouldn't be accepting these figures. We should be demanding you apologise for these figures. So I, I'm afraid your arguments are, I, I'm sorry to say, Donald, not only threadbare, but disingenuous. Henry, Henry where, where, where do you think this goes next in terms of, of an argument? It, does it stay as yes versus no on, on independence until that is you know, either resolved by, by, a, by a, a, a referendum? Or do you believe that you know, some of your ideas begin... To, to be inculcated by yourself and others. Right, let me be, I've been, I've been honest throughout this, brutally honest, and say that, look, I'm not an optimist about the possibilities of the union changing. But I do believe that there are ways that the union can change to accommodate an assertive, an ambitious, a modern Scotland moving forward. So my, my concern is that I would like to see that as a possibility. But it means that not only does the union, which is, you know, the four nations, it's about Westminster, it's about the Tories, it's about Labour, it's about the Liberals. It's a massive change of opinion. And that's one point. The second point, and this is Mike's point, yeah. what would be the time scale for that to happen? Certainly, I don't want it to be forever. So I'm sceptical, but I do believe that it's part of the settled will idea to try and get some changes and some thinking so that when there's a referendum, it maybe needn't be an indie ref too. What it might be, as we thought might happen in 2014, that there are other questions. Third option. Third question. Okay. Let, 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 you mentioned parties there. One, one is you that came out in some of the, you know, the draft texts that, that I've had a glance at from yourself. You, you said that the SNP, whether Labour like it or not, and you know, presumably as a Labour, former Labour First Minister, you don't, but you say the SNP broadly are just seen as the, as the defenders of Scottish interests in terms of the contemporary political debate? No, I mean, I think the way I put it, Brian, was this, that because the other political parties lost traction after 2003 and 2007, um, they left the field. And what you had was a situation where the SNP rightly seized their opportunity and in 14 years have built up a domination within the political landscape. But what I thought you were going to say, Brian, was that, look, even if the SNP didn't exist today, as the force they are in politics, or just as a force, yeah. you'd still have a case to radically reform a union that has changed very little, remains highly centralised, and is not looking forward to any four-nation structure. So I think that's important. And I agree. Mike, Mike Russell, Mike then Donald, Mike Russell. I think you know, there are, you know, in, in that parallel universe where we're having this discussion where the SNP does not exist, <laughs> um, there would be require, the requirement for the union to change. But the change, and this is a really crucial point, the change that people who are presently running the union want is not a progressive change. It's a regressive change. They want to go backwards. They've gone backwards. They, they want to revert to empire, essentially. And that is what they are doing. And unfortunately, that is at the heart of the problem. Scotland, as a small, modern, mainstream European left of centre democracy, you know, is going in one direction. Some may say not progressive enough, but it's going in one direction. And south of the border, the government, I'm not saying the people, but the government of, of, of the UK is a regressive, backward-looking government. And that is the dichotomy. That is, that is what... And when, when, and when you say empire, when you say empire you're, you're presuming Scotland is one of the colonies. No, I, I, think, I think the description, you know, you, you are familiar with the reading on this, Brian. You know, Hector's self colonization of Scotland is an interesting concept. I, I, it's not a classic colony by any manner of means. But it is, unfortunately, or fortunately, I mean, I think in terms of our potential, fortunately, it is progressive and moving in a direction which is in step with the rest of Europe, whereas UK is moving in another direction. 
and pretty disastrously, I have to say, because it's not even doing it well, it's doing it spectacularly badly, uh, being run by, I think one of the present um, senior Tories said the other day that it was the second worst government that the UK had ever had. Um, the, no, the worst, the second worst government, the worst was the one that they, they just reshuffled from. That's what we've got, a backward-looking, regressive UK government. And, and, and I'm the story for Tories like Donald, because Donald is a much more a one-nation Tory, and his party has, I'm afraid, departed from him. Donald, you, you, you were shaking your head and grimacing pretty vigorously throughout that entire, that entire uh, comment from Mike Russell. Yeah, I, I just don't accept that. It won't come as a surprise. I think that's a caricature. Um, I, I think the, you know, to describe, um, you know, the, the ambition, for instance, to uh, come to a long-term solution in relation to social care is not the actions of a regressive backward government, but actually a very forward-thinking long-term government. I think, you know, uh, uh, lots of examples, you know, the, what, the, what the UK government's trying to do and trying to rebalance has done throughout the, um, throughout the pandemic. So, you know, I, you know I, I, I simply don't accept that, that caricature. Henry McLeish, uh, do you think that the, 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 if, the, if the change has to come within a political party, do your own party, the Labour Party, do you believe that they are addressing the, the, the issues that you have raised? No. No, and that, 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 that makes me more perplexed about it. Um, and so can I just make two points? One, Bill Donald, one, Mike. Oh, please. Mike made the point about the problems at Westminster. You know, I describe it as delusional, you know, this um, global Britain stuff that, that, that Boris is involved in. You know, it's trying to rebuild um, something which may or may not have existed a century ago. And that's one of the big issues, Brian, because, you know, that exceptionalism, that sense of being a prisoner of history, that trying to recreate the past, this is not what a modern Scotland or any part of the United Kingdom um, actually needs. And I think that the, the, the other point for me um, about the yeah. question of change is that I'm, I'm really trying to put down a test, which you know I'm not confident that they will pass, that the union, Westminster, its institutions, the major, major parties, can actually devise something that will keep Scotland in, in place. And if that doesn't happen, then that's the problem. OK, we're coming to the, to, towards the close. I'm going to give each of you a, 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 a wee spell to just give me a forecast or, or a, a, a prediction uh, uh, of where you think uh, matters are, are going and on a, if possible, on a time scale. Asking a lot, I know, but there, there we go. Mike Russell first. Well, I'm not going to give you a time scale, Brian. Uh, what I am going to say to you is that I think a referendum is what the people of Scotland have voted for and they will have it. They must have it. And if they have that referendum, I shall campaign very hard for independence. I hope Henry will be alongside me in that campaign. Um, I don't believe that the UK, the present UK can reform itself. And I don't think the present UK is moving progressively forward to a position where it can do that. It's going in the opposite direction. So if I may put it this way, it's time for independence. Yes. And the time is as soon as possible. Thank you. Donald Cameron, what your, what's, what's your, your, your take on where, where we're heading and, and if possible on a timescale? I, I mean, I, I don't believe that, 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 that there is the moral authority for another referendum. I don't think that people's focus um, should be on that. Um, you know, people across Scotland have got so much more to worry about um, in terms of their jobs, uh, in terms of the pandemic. And, I, you know, at the moment, we, we've got to concentrate on our recovery from COVID and not on another divisive referendum. Well, Cameron, thanks for that. Henry, what's your, Henry McLeish, what, what's your take on where... We could be going. I know you, you, you said you're not exactly optimistic about the scenario you're painting. What's your take on where we could be going? Well, well point one, Brian, I don't think there'll be an early referendum, um, partly because the, the Westminster or Boris Johnson will not allow it. I think, secondly, there will be a referendum, maybe post five years ahead. I think in that referendum, if there's, a, if there's any suspicion that Westminster is not for turning in any way that we've talked about this evening, then Scots will have a different choice because it will mean voting for an independent Scotland, knowing that Westminster does not care enough or is active enough to provide the kind of environment with which a modern, ambitious Scotland can move forward. And in those circumstances, you think there would be a vote for independence? I, I, could, I, I don't know what the result would be, but I certainly think, I mean, people argue just now, for example, that Boris Johnson is a kind of great recruitment sergeant for the cause. Brexit was supposed to be a recruitment sergeant for the cause. Now, both of these might manifest itself 
as we move forward. And it could well be, Brian, that this debate will move away from, from patriotism and nationalism to the one where I think it should be about governance, about democracy, about politics, and about a good constitutional setup that gives people, as Mike says, their place in what we do as a, as a country. Henry, Donald, Mike, thank you all very, very much indeed. Thanks to everyone for listening, watching, or whatever one does with a podcast. I've never been entirely certain, but uh, from me, Brian Taylor, to the new. This podcast was brought to you by The Herald. Take 20% off an annual subscription to The Herald with our exclusive podcast code. Just add Herald Pod 2021 to your basket and get instant, unfiltered access to our website. And you can also get involved with the Brian Taylor podcast as well. Tune in on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube every Thursday afternoon to catch Brian and his panel chat live and ask your questions to the people across the political scene.